at the Center of Excellence in Human Books and Research. Um, I'm a PhD uh, qualified from UK and the area of developmental molecular biology, currently doing research and functional genomics at CGMR. Uh, it's my pleasure um, to introduce the first speaker of this session, uh, Professor Stephen Shearer uh, from um, Sick Kids um, Hospital in Toronto, uh, Canada. Um, Stephen Shearer is a well known figure um, in the field of uh, medical genomics, and especially he is our uh, editor in chief of the MPJ Genomic Medicine. Uh, he is currently affiliated with the uh, CGMR and KEU. Um, Steve today is going to speak about a genomic basis for autism spectrum and related disorders. Uh, please welcome Steve uh, for the next 20 minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I've been assigned 20 minutes to speak, so I thought I would give you an update on the work we published in the last year. Can you open this one? Uh, and then also um, on published work from our laboratory. But to begin, I, I just wanted to further the comments from Magdalena Skipper that the journal's come along well, um, and we're very excited that the first issue will come January 13th. We have, uh, I think it's eight papers coming, and very high quality, emphasis on uh, international contributions, uh, and uh, focus on genomic medicine, and lots of new submissions coming in. So. If you have uh, high quality work that you want to publish, please submit it and uh, we will try to get it published in, in the journal. It's very exciting. <clears throat> okay, so um, I thought I would frame a presentation around <clears throat> really the challenges uh, and why we're performing research in autism spectrum disorder or ASD, in particular with, with respect to diagnosis and treatment. <clears throat> and, um, the primary challenge we have is that presently there's no effective medicine, or drug treatment for the core features that are observed in autism spectrum disorder, <clears throat> namely the uh, deficits of social interaction skills, language, and repetitive restrictive behaviors, and also including cognition. Um, there's medicines for things like anxiety, which are comorbid with, AD, uh, with ASD, but <clears throat> there's nothing for the actual core features. There are many medical comorbidities, uh, complications that associate with ASD, including uh, seizures, epilepsy, we see in roughly 50% of cases, intellectual disability, and also 50% of cases, <coughs> anxiety, uh, GI problems, and many other medical complications. So often the medical complications are treated, but one really needs to understand <coughs> the genetic uh, factors that are associated. Perhaps most importantly, the clinical diagnosis is difficult. It typically will take a developmental pedi pediatrician upwards of perhaps a whole day or, or two days, multiple visits to have a full diagnosis. So because of this, the wait lists are long. In, in our city of Toronto and Canada, <coughs> which is the major center, uh, we typically would have 500 kids on the wait list at any given time. Uh, so of course, if we have a, a genetic test, we can administer those tests much faster. Um, the example I show on this slide here is a child uh, who went through a, a long odyssey of diagnosis. He visited uh, eight different clinics at our children's hospital, and it wasn't until we found, found uh, performed microarray, chromosome microarray analysis, that we detected he had a chromosome 16p11.2 deletion. As you can see, he has a severe uh, obesity, and because of his anxiety, he was put on. Um, Risperidone to help control the anxiety, and that actually exasperated his uh, obesity. Uh, and we're seeing now chromosome 16p deletion carriers often. This is the case. So, uh, determining that he carried the deletion not only um, <coughs> identified the cause of his autism, but also informed on the drugs that he should or should not take with respect to other medical complications. So, this really kind of forms the basis of <coughs> um, the hypothesis that is, we have a genomic understanding, provide a new path forward um, to treat the kids, to understand what autism is and what it is not. Uh, so, this is a paper we published just this year, um, where we uh, conducted a very thorough analysis, clinically and uh, genetically, of um, 100, or actually 200 consecutive uh, diagnoses that came through a clinic in 
in Memorial University in Newfoundland. And we selected that clinic because the developmental pediatrician had trained in our center. And the kids were examined uh, very detailed, including imaging, including uh, dysmorphology testing, and many different types of measures. And then we performed <coughs> state-of-the-art chromosome microanalysis and exome sequencing. And subsequently, we've done whole genome sequencing too, but that's not shown on this slide. <coughs> to cut a long story short, uh, when you use the standards that we've developed over the years, including those, um, uh, include the uh, American College of Medical Genetic Guidelines, we could use the microanalysis to detect um, the cause of autism in 7% of kids. So these are based on C and Ds that are found, and then using whole exome sequencing uh, in 6% of cases, and there's actually one case where we found a chromosome uh, C and D, and then also a, a exome-based uh, sequence alteration. So actually the child was carrying two mutations using, found by the two different technologies. So the take-home message here is that using these first-line type tests, the diagnostic rate from CMA was about 9%, whole exome sequencing 8%, uh, and then some individuals having very uh, 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 clinically uh, complex forms of ASD actually we could detect in 37.5% uh, a large chromosome change. So for those dysmorphic, dysmorphic kids, actually, we highly recommend a genetic test performed. So this has really become the standard of care, uh, certainly in Canada, and I think it's, it's spreading worldwide. What was quite interesting is often we found that the individuals carried two or more mutations in different uh, genes that were associated with medical genetic syndromes. I don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but I would point you to the paper. We provided many different examples of the different combinations of genes and how they impacted on the complex phenotypic presentation. But um, this is a list of the, the top six genes that are uh, quote unquote mutated in the uh, roughly 3,000 Canadian families that we've been studying over the last decade or so. Uh, and I won't go through any detail, but the top hit is the 16p deletion, and we often see duplications that I mentioned uh, in that child that showed in the first slide. <coughs> uh, also deletions of the Nerexin 1 synaptic gene, so the large gene on chromosome 2, many different isoforms. Interestingly, uh, and I think I spoke about this last time, we found an excellent gene. Uh, I didn't mention that we see a, a 4 to 1 uh, male to female sex bias in autism spectrum disorder. So one might expect that there would be genes on the X chromosome involved. This is a non-coding gene, and we see this actually mutated roughly 0.5% of our population also. So that provides a genetic test. Uh, if a male inherits this deletion from their uh, mother, in fact, we can do <coughs> testing prenatally and postnatally, and even carrier screening to identify that that individual will be at risk to enroll in an early behavioral intervention. Duplications of chromosome 7, this is the region that's reciprocal to the deletions you see in williams beeren syndrome. And then um, this C and B region at chromosome 1, Q2, 1, we only see the uh, duplication associated with autism, whereas the deletions are associated with uh, heart developmental disorder, multiple congenital abnormalities. And then these synaptic scaffolding genes, shank 1, 2, and 3, and there's lots of these that have been found now. So these are really the crux of the, making the genes that are involved in, in the, the neuronal SIPS synapse. And um, uh, I think this is probably the primary cause of uh, a large proportion of the, at least the genetic forms of, of ASD. Now, the big question is, are these specific uh, mutations to the autism spectrum disorder presentation? And the short answer is no. We see mutations in the same gene present in schizophrenia, bipolar disease, ADHD, intellectual disability, the list is, is really on the right hand side here. So this pr presents a, a, a complex um, clinical question is when you find these, seeing these in particular prenatally, what does it actually mean uh, for, with respect to trajectories and outcomes for these individuals? <coughs> um, and we started to look at that. In fact, we stumbled across, across this uh, chromosome 2Q3 duplication case. We found it to be involved in our autism cohort, our pediatric autism cohort, essentially at the same time that we identified the same duplication in an adult uh, clinical cohort that presented as uh, schizophrenia. Um, and when we were able to look at family histories of a few of these cases that we had multiple generations of information, the children 
uh, of the same family that carried these duplications with adults actually also showed presentation of the schizophrenia and the autism. So I just show this really uh, because most of the data we've been collecting in most groups worldwide, when you're studying a particular disorder, it's, it's somewhat static. Uh, and what we really need is longitudinal data to do these um, <coughs> genotype-phenotype correlations. But quite often, you can kind of meet in the middle and use this type of data to predict what the long-term outcomes will be uh, in children who are carrying these types of chromosome uh, copy number variants. Uh, so, in fact, we're going back now and doing more um, detailed studies of family histories to see if we can predict that uh, many of these other CMVs I showed in my previous slide, in fact, there's over 100 different regions of the genome, uh, might be predictive of long-term adult outcomes uh, once we actually have collected that data. So um, there's now well over 100 different ASD risk genes. This is a meta-analysis that we performed uh, in 2014 and, and also added a bunch of exome sequencing data from 2015. Um, so this presents uh, 94 high-confidence uh, ASD risk genes where we've looked at uh, some type of loss of function type mutation or disruption based on a copy number variant of a particular gene. And then map them into uh, genetic pathways based on gene set interaction, we heard about that earlier this morning. And um, the take-home message here is reproducibly from study to study, and again, this is a meta-analysis of everything that was published up until uh, just recently you see the uh, pathways of neuronal development and axon guidance showing up in yellow, uh, chromatin um, modification, transcriptional regulation in blue, and the MAPK and uh, signaling pathways showing the light green here. So again, this is really exciting because for the first time now we have pathways that one can target in molecular um, diagnostics, not molecular diagnostics, but actually the, uh, molecular therapeutic development. Uh, and this is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to modulate these pathways through small molecular uh, new medicines. Um, so what we spent uh, the larger part of the last year doing is, uh, and we're still, this is still ongoing, is, um, is, is undertaking a, a very large scale data gathering set of experiments. <laughs> and this is called the, the Missing uh, Autism Sequencing Project, MSSNG. The eyes are dropped out because uh, the goal of the project is to identify the missing information in autism. So we've identified a, a large number of autism risk genes, but it only counts for perhaps for roughly 20% or so uh, of the cases. So uh, we can, based on um, heritability studies of twins and family studies, we anticipate that at least 50 to 90% of autism uh, is contributed based on genetic factors. <coughs> So to try to get to the underlying genetic architecture, um, we felt we needed to do a lot more sequencing and we needed to do whole genome sequencing. So to capture the whole complement of genetic variants and look beyond just the 1% of the genome that encodes proteins. So uh, with Google um, and Autism Speaks in the States, we launched on this project and we've now sequenced fully uh, 6,000 whole genomes. Uh, and, and the target is 10,000, which will be completed in the next couple months or so. Um, and we developed, uh, <coughs> these were the, the well-phenotype Canadian cohorts and some from the U.S. also. It's going to go international in the phase two of the project. Uh, developed consents for most uh, uh, open data release. Developed cloud-based databases and tools with Google. So all of the data uh, from these 6,000 is actually in the Google Cloud now. Um, 2,000 are publicly available. The other 4,000 have just got signed off will be transferred before Christmas. And all of the high-throughput annotation tools we've developed for our, our high-throughput computing facility at, at SickKids in Toronto have been transferred into um, essentially applications that can be utilized in the Google Cloud now, so those will be soon available. So the idea really is to get the data out uh, to the community so as many people can actually take their experiments to the cloud and do uh, new analyses using new tools on this large-scale data set. But I'll just show you um, our most recent uh, analyses, uh, some of which is published, some of which is unpub unpublished. I won't go through this in any detail, but if there's any uh, technical people who want to talk about our annotation pipelines, that's really what my laboratory does. Uh, we spent a lot of time developing tools, uh, and, and we're using machine learning approaches now to look for uh, new patterns in the non-coding sequences of the genome, for example. Um, 
So whereas we've learned a lot looking at the protein coding sequences, I think the real rich uh, gold, or if you will, of the discoveries will come in, in scanning the data for the 99% uh, of the DNA that's non-coding and how it affects, in some cases, that list of genes I showed on my earlier slide, and in some cases, other new target lists. Um, so the sequencing is really, is, is really a, a step to get, uh, I guess, to the next stage, which is really the annotation. So this was um, the first 85 families so the, that we, we published on just this, this year. Um, we completed a high-throughput sequencing. This was a 60x coverage genome, uh, so very high coverage. We called, uh, I won't go through all the details, but high-quality SMB calling and also structural variation calling. Uh, probably the, the best annotated set of uh, data for whole genomes, uh, I think, that I've seen, certainly in the world. And the, the question here was, if we sequenced uh, families that had two affected children with ASD, what percentage of the time would they share the same highly penetrant or presumed highly penetrant pathogenic mutation? Uh, so we did the experiment, did lots of annotation, lots of validation. Everything we talked about is validated in laboratory experimentation. And you can go to the paper, but this is the list of the genes that we thought were uh, informative. And to come to the question, we found um, in, in roughly 31%, so 11 of 36 of these families were identified a de novo or rare inherited, uh, or rare inherited ASD risk variant. Uh, we found that it was different than, um, sorry, it was the same as the one that was found in the sibling. So in 69%, so roughly two-thirds of families that had two affected kids, they were actually carrying different high-risk variants. So when we first saw that, it was kind of surprising to us. But when we think about it, we know there's hundreds of different ASD risk genes. Mutation rate is high. De novo mutations are often involved. So in fact, it wasn't too surprising. And even when we went and looked much closer uh, at those, uh, we considered to be very conservative, uh, called high-risk loci, using very stringent criteria. It's what we call class, class one variants. The concordance rate uh, was still only it's like 42 percent, and when we went back and looked at uh, thousands of cases that we, uh, families we looked at um, using clinical microarrays, for example, again we saw only a 50 percent concordance rate. So more often than not, the, the affected siblings are carrying uh, highly different, pen, different highly penetrant mutations that push them across the ASD threshold. And I've just uh, listed three examples from this study here. This is a figure from the paper. Um, to highlight the power of whole genome sequencing, but also um, uh, to highlight the, the families that we studied here. So we identified uh, a deletion in the SCN2A gene in the index case shown on the right, uh, and then also the same deletion uh, in, in the female sibling here. So that this deletion would not have been detected using whole exome or using microarrays because it, it's very small, it's 1.7 kilobases, and it occurs in the intron, uh, deleting exon 18 shown here. This was an interesting example, actually, because uh, we didn't know um, that, uh, um, well, I should say that the, the sibling was, a, a, was when, he, when she was ascertained, she was suspected to be on the ASD spectrum. Uh, and it wasn't until we did the sequence of the mutation and, and identified to the clinician, who needs to go back and look closer, that she actually got the full diagnosis. So this is another example where we identified a de novo mutation in the syntax binding protein 1 gene. Uh, this is an epilepsy gene. It's now been found in many mutations in unrelated individuals with ASD. This was a, an example of an inherited mutation, the UBE3A gene, passed from mom. This is an imprinted locus, and when the, uh, it's passed to a, a boy, um, he's affected with Angelman syndrome and also uh, autism. You see in autism, roughly 40% of kids with Angelman syndrome. Uh, this was an interesting uh, de novo mutation of thyroid hormone receptor alpha gene. Um, and at the time we found this, it was unique in the literature, but while well, this was going through the publication process, there were multiple cases published with both intellectual disability and also autism. And then an inherited gene in another epilepsy, uh, mutation in another epilepsy gene called CATNA2, which has now been implicated in autism through other studies. So I'm going to quickly go through the next state. This is all unpublished data. So in the next 200 um, families we sequenced, um, we looked at families that had only one affected individual. Okay, these were all sequenced in the ISIC 2000, and we were very fortunate that there was a control data set available uh, from a Dutch group that we could use actually to do 
uh, in a case control type um, burden analysis. And I would just only point out that it's, when you do these type of comparisons, it's very important to have a, a platform match to a control data set to compare against. So um, this is all data on the high seat 2000, but going forward, all of our whole genome data is on the, on the high seat X platform. So we're actually generating a similar set of controls uh, in pediatrics and for people to use. Uh, and to cut a long story short, a lot of analyses we developed uh, new tools to call de novo mutations. So all of my uh, analysis is really based on de novo mutations. Um, we identified that 70% of the de novo mutations originate from the, the father's germline. So the dad's contributing the majority of the new mutations, uh, which was interesting because 20 years ago the, the disorder was blamed on the mothers for not raising their children properly. So we see a, an increase rate in, in males over females of the germline SMVs, indels, um, and then also uh, somatic areas you'd expect to be the same rate. I'll come back to this a little bit later, but uh, this is what we saw. So some of these variants we detected were actually um, somatic um, postmyotic uh, variants, postzygotic, sorry. <coughs> Now, the correlation with the males is actually significant when you look at the age of the male, of the father. Um, and of course, there is no association with females here. So the uh, fathers at an advanced age tend to have more genome mutations. So this in many medical genetic situations, but certainly is the case in ASD. Um, this was a new finding. It was quite interesting. When you look at the, the clustering of, uh, of the mutations, we, we found more often than not, these de novo mutations, when there were multiple mutations in the same individual, they tended to be clustered along the chromosome. And it was uh, found to be the case more often in females and in, in maternal carriers. So uh, we looked a little bit closer at this, and we could see that the distance, uh, when we saw this type of effect, it was often associated, in fact, most often associated with uh, de novo copy number variants in the same genome. So it looks like the copy number variant actually throws off the DNA repair mechanism. This is just one example where we see four de novo point mutations next to a de novo copy number variant. And it turns out that one of these mutations hits a protein coding region in this uh, gene that encodes an ASD risk locus. So we do have a contribution of maternal mutations also to ASD, but it's only associated when the mother is carrying a de novo copy number variant also. So this is a, a new finding from this study. Uh, and then if you look now into the non-coding genome, um, we identified uh, propensity of mutations in cases over controls, not only in the exonic regions, but also in the five prime regions and some other, I don't have all the data here, but uh, upstream elements uh, and then um, enhancer elements across the genome. So this has um, been replicated now in two different cohorts. Um, and of those mutations that I mentioned, up until this point, we assumed actually that these were all um, uh, germline de novo events, but in fact, uh, using the, the high quality, high coverage sequence, uh, we can actually determine which of those are likely to be somatic in origin, just based on the allelic representation from the read coverage. So um, this is an example here where if you look at the, the hump in the graph, you can predict that these ones here, down in the 10, to 30% range are actually somatic mutations. Uh, represented so we typically see 50% of the lip ratio. Uh, you see it down here, suggesting that there are somatic changes. And uh, across these um, several hundred samples, we can see that there's roughly 3.2 uh, somatic mutations. So you, from a clinical genetic perspective, that's important to know because you wouldn't expect them to have the same effect because um, you know, there's more of the cells that are carrying the intact gene. But this was one example, again, coming back to the Norexin gene I mentioned earlier in my presentation, uh, where we identified a non-synonymous missense mutation in Norexin 1. Uh, and this is at a 16% allelic fracture, so about 32% of the cells are carrying uh, the, the, the protein. So uh, he still has autism. We haven't found any other mutations. Uh, I think it's yet to be seen if this is actually the pathogenic event, but I think it's an important clue to follow. Um, I just have two more slides. Uh, we, I did mention we've also run the uh, Illumina 450 methylation arrays on all of the samples. We're doing whole genome sequencing and developed a, a new tool to uh, identify out outlier data from this methylation data. And quite excitingly, using a principal component analysis, we identified 
uh, outliers for your method with different methylation profiles shown here. And we went back and looked at the genomic sequence. We identified a de novo mutation in DNMT3A uh, and then separately in the ADNP gene. And these are genes that are involved in chromatin remodeling. So in fact, the genetic mutations uh, likely explain the differences in the methylation profiles. This is a mutation that was inherited. Uh, we can't explain, actually, uh, uh, the pattern of, of differential regulation, but the correlation remains strong. So just on my last slide, I think this is something we all have to think about. Um, this was a great example where, in the index case, we did the sequencing that identified uh, uh, what turned out to be an inherited loss of the Norexin 1 gene that, in the clinical diagnostic setting, would have been signed out as being pathogenic. Uh, we identified a second deletion in the NVD5 gene. Again, this is also an ASD risk gene. Would have signed, been signed out in the diagnostic laboratory as being pathogenic. So this male has two damaging mutations. And then we looked at the affected sibling, who uh, also has ASD but a lesser form. Uh, she has the same two deletions, suggesting that these are actually inherited. We went back and looked at the dad, and sure enough, he passed on both these deleted chromosomes. Uh, we phenotyped him extensively, and he's just doing quite fine. So this is what we call kind of resilience. Because for some reason, he's resilient. Perhaps it's something else that's genetic or something else he's doing. Uh, and I just raise this because, of course, uh, it's interesting to pursue from the research perspective, but also raises conundrums of prenatal and genetic counseling. So just in summary, um, we now know there's lots of genes for ASD, uh, significant genetic heterogeneity. Uh, by doing whole genome sequencing, we get a better profile of the mutations that we can now build much better quantitative multifactorial models by having these other mutations outside the coding regions. Uh, many of the genes found in ASD are also involved in other neurodevelopmental disorders, so I think the question of what is ASD is quite uh, important. And then finally, uh, as we've seen over and over again, um, you really need to ex examine the <coughs> DNA in the genomic medicine studies with the highest resolution technology and use the best tools to mine out all the variants and do your correlation studies to provide the best information and decision making. And I would just stop there. This is our group in Toronto. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, for lay this section, please, if you have a question, kindly shout. Shout loudly and I'll give you the priority to ask the question. Uh, for the men side here, one question, that's all. Steve's choice. One question. I have one here. So, do you have a microphone or you want to yell at all the people? I can shout. Often, Kleinfelder syndrome is associated with ASD. Did you find any link that would explain that? Yeah, so the comment was Kleinfelder syndrome is often associated with ASD. Um, all of the cases we're studying are idiopathic cases. So any 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 um, of the individuals with chromosome abnormalities would, would not be in this research cohort. So yes, we see them, but they're not in this research cohort. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry, but we've got to limit it to just one question.